This is a News 12 special report. The Westchester State of the County Address. Good evening, everyone. A look inside the Westchester County Courthouse where County Executive Rob Astorino will deliver his State of the County Address in mere moments tonight. And you can watch the State of the County live here on News 12 and News12.com. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott McGee. This is Rob Astorino's first State of the County since he was reelected to a second term last November. This State of the County, though, is very different than any he has delivered in the past since he is running for governor against another political powerhouse from Westchester, Governor Andrew Cuomo. So it will be very interesting to see what Astorino has to say about Albany, state mandates, and their cost to taxpayers, which is always a consistent topic of his administration. Now, taxes have been the primary focus of his past campaigns. That issue helped him overcome voter concerns over his views on social issues in a more liberal county. You see him starting to walk into the uh, courthouse right here. The county executive likely to touch on his accomplishments and the challenges Westchester still faces. Recently, the ongoing fight with the federal government over affordable housing in Westchester has become center stage in the governor's race. New York State Democrats unleashing their first attack ad against Republican Rob Astorino this week, focusing on the affordable housing controversy and Astorino's fight with the feds. Will that issue come up tonight? Almost certainly. Mr. Astorino will also talk about the latest on revitalization plans for Ripe Playland. Of course, just yesterday, Sustainable Playland, the group chosen to manage the park and make it more profitable, came back to the negotiating table. Now, joining us to watch the speech and provide their political commentary, who else but our News 12 political analysts? We've got Tony Sag and Lois, uh, Lawrence Otis Graham here for us. Thanks you both for being here. We'll have lots to talk about, I'm sure. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, well, you are watching special live coverage of the Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino's State of the County Address. Astorino's speech will be going on here in any minute. We are just waiting now for the uh, color guard to begin their portion of this. Uh, Mr. Astorino, uh, tell me, Tony, what do you think the stakes are for this speech? Well, the county executive, I think, is going to really point out to the fact that Westchester's never worked better, certainly not in a long time. Uh, we have now a coalition government with Mr. Kapowitz heading the Board of Legislators, with Republicans in positions of leadership there working alongside Democrats. And a lot of that has come because of the county executive's Turn leadership. This is going to be the fifth year, Scott, he's going to announce no tax increase. That is unprecedented, particularly in New York State and at this tough economic time. So I think you're going to hear the success story of Westchester, and I think it will resonate very well. Uh, Lauren, so what are Democrats going to be listening for, watching for during this speech? I think Democrats are going to be watching for the fact that um, the, uh, the um, county executive is probably going to be laying out what people are expecting to hear during this campaign because it's very clear that he's in campaign mode even though Governor Cuomo isn't responding. Uh, it's very clear that county executive is leading up to the Republican convention. He's also going to probably try to um, express the HUD the HUD issue in a way that he's stood up to the federal government, even though there are obviously many people in Westchester that are upset about the funds that have been lost through this. And I think that he's also going to talk about, the, as Tony had pointed out, the tax issues, the fact okay. that taxes have not been raised. I tell you, why don't we listen in real quick while the national anthem plays. So as we wait for the color guard to leave the courthouse there, Rob Astorino waiting for him to uh, begin his speech for the state of the county, which is likely to be the most important speech he's given just yet. Uh, I'm curious, Tony, what is it like for a candidate like this when you know this is a state of the county, should be a relatively state affair, but this is the biggest speech of his life at this point, is it not? What? I think the media coverage is going to change. You probably have a lot of outlets covering the Westchester County State of the County address that weren't there last year. Right. But Rob is so great at communicating, which is one of his 
wonderful assets as a candidate and as a leader in government because these are moments that he really knows how to communicate and reach people um, without the filter, obviously, of our general commentary and analysis. So I do expect him to do very well. He is a former broadcaster and can't wait to hear what he has to say. Right, let's hear what that he has America, to say. America, and she was great. <laughs> American Idol, watch out. Please have a seat. Thank you for coming. Well, good evening and welcome. It is a special honor to be in the courthouse tonight. In 1958, President Eisenhower proclaimed May 1st as Law Day with these words. The world no longer has a choice between force and law. If civilization is to survive, it must choose the rule of law. Those words continue to guide us. We may be just a tiny piece of civilization here in Westchester, but whatever our challenges, whatever our differences, it is the rule of law that sees us through. Our host, the Honorable Alan Shankman, administrative judge for the 9th Judicial District, could not be with us tonight. He has his own Law Day commitment. But my thanks go out to him and all the attorneys and other professionals here tonight who have dedicated themselves to the law and are not charging us for this hour, so thank you. <laughs> also with us are County Clerk Tim Iadoni, Putnam County Executive Mary Ellen O'Dell, thank you for joining us, and a host of other elected officials from around the county. <clears throat> now I get to recognize my favorite team, Team Astorino. This is my fifth State of the County address, and the first time my wife Sheila and I have joined, uh, been joined by all three of our children. Sean, Kylie, and Ashlyn. And it wasn't hard to get the kids to come today. I told them, you owe me one. I got you out of the Common Core math test this morning. <laughs> <clears throat> I also want to welcome at home uh, everybody who is watching us on News 12. So those of you with us tonight in the courthouse may have noticed our photo exhibit hanging on the wall in the back. We asked how many hashtag live Westchester, and you showed us by submitting photos on Facebook and Twitter. And social media has become an important tool for us. For everyone tweeting along tonight, please use hashtag Astorino SOTC. If you don't know what that means, join the rest of us. No, I do. I really do. <laughs> well, we are here to continue a tradition that's actually older than Law Day. It was 77 years ago when the county charter declared it to be the duty of the county executive to communicate with the county board. Specifically, the charter instructs me to present a summary statement of the county's finances and departmental activities to the Board of Legislators. It is my honor to do that tonight and my pledge to keep that summary under six hours, so don't worry. I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Board of Legislators who are with us tonight, and good government requires balance. My thanks to new board chairman Michael Kapowitz for working with me uh, to bring all sides to a place where the partisanship stopped and solutions took hold on tough issues like the budget, daycare, and playland, to name just a few. So thank you very much for being with us. Well, the news to start this year's State of the County Address is good. No lives were lost last year among Westchester's men and women serving proudly in our military around the world. For that, for that we are truly thankful. And to those who have served proudly and returned safely, Westchester County has not forgotten its debt to you. A home and job seems like the least we can do for our veterans. Our departments of Veterans Affairs and Social Services set an ambitious goal to house 75 homeless veterans in 100 days as part of a national 100,000 homes initiative. We met and exceeded that goal. Since August, we have found housing for 150 veterans, but we didn't stop there. We also found jobs for 63 veterans, and the work continues. In fact, we won't stop until every veteran in Westchester has a job and a place to call home. Our success to date is because so many have been willing to help. Bassett Furniture is just one example. When word got out of our efforts to house homeless veterans, 
Bassett Furniture generously stepped up with a $16,000 donation to furnish two of the apartments. No one asked, they just came forward. So tonight, I'd like to recognize Robin St. Denny, general manager of the new Bassett Furniture location in Hartsdale. Let me also recognize and thank Vito Pinto, the head of our Veteran Service Agency, Kevin McGuire, our Commissioner of Social Services, and Phil Geal, our Deputy Commissioner of Social Services. And to all the other members of this team effort, thank you for letting our veterans know their service to our county and our country is always appreciated and never forgotten. Thank you. This year's State of the County Address is a report card, not just on the previous year, but on the last four years since my administration came into office in 2010. So using that broader perspective, I'd like to frame my remarks around three broad topics. What have we learned? What have we done? And what do we do next? The short answer to all three questions is a lot, but let's dig into each one. So what have we learned? Well, we have learned about the power of collaboration. Now, at my inauguration in 2010, I outlined the compass we would use to govern, and we call them the three Ps, and they may, may be familiar to all of you by now. Protect taxpayers, preserve essential services, and promote economic growth. Now, protecting taxpayers recognizes the simple truth that government must live within its means. Preserving essential services defines our mission that as a government, we must do all we can to meet the critical needs of our people. Promoting economic growth is the way we take care of the first two. Economic prosperity is how we keep taxes in check and still have the money to provide the services that our residents need and count on. Time has shown that the three Ps have us working on the right things, but that's not enough. You also have to deliver results, which brings us back to collaboration. No matter how many votes you receive, you never get them all. But the day you take office, you represent all the people. So your first job is to bring together those who are for you, those who are against you, and those who are still undecided. The role of the county executive is to bring as many people to the table as possible, to be the collaborator in chief who gets input from all the familiar voices, but also seeks out and listens to new voices. In other words, no one with a stake in the solution gets overlooked. We began with formal outreach. Women, the disabled, veterans, African Americans, Hispanics, youth, and the LGBT community all have boards and offices that report directly to the county executive. Then we went a step further and began reaching out in non-traditional ways. I created a faith-based community partnership to strengthen the bonds between county government and religious organizations in our communities. Heading that effort is Rosa Boone, who is also our Deputy Commissioner of Social Services. Now, as part of that initiative, I meet regularly with the United Black Clergy under the leadership of Bishop C. Nathan Edwards of uh, Friendship Baptist Church. And we have home and away games, my conference room and his church in Mount Vernon. So Bishop Edwards and Rosa Boone, thank you for your service to church and state. Hispanics are the fastest growing ethnic group in our county, showing gains in every community in the last census. A todos nuestros residentes hispanos, le mando una calida bienvenida. Estoy orgulloso de representar a todos nuestros residentes y nuestro gran condado de Westchester. Pueden encontrar el video en español del estado del condado en nuestro sitio web, westchestergov.com. Espero que lo vean y nos manden sus comentarios. In English, immigration has always been one of, the, one of our country's strengths, special strengths. In Westchester, we are blessed by our rich diversity. In this very room, I have had the honor and privilege of watching new residents take the oath to become citizens of the United States. According to the latest census figures, more than 20% of Westchester residents were born in other countries. The largest numbers come from Europe at 23%. Asia and South America are tied at 19% each. 
They're followed by the Caribbean at 18%, Central America at 16%, and Africa at 3%. In fact, our neighbors to the north in Canada round things out at 1%. <laughs> Who knew Westchester's 1%ers were all Canadian? Uh, <laughs> You know, for all new immigrants, the government of their new country can seem remote, mysterious, and uninviting. At the county level, we would like to change that. So tonight, I'm announcing the new role of Immigrant Services Liaison within the office of the county executive. The idea is to ease and speed the transition of our newest residents in two ways. The first is to break down cultural and language barriers. The second is to help them steer through the government bureaucracy. A key focus will also be working with immigrants who are interested in starting new businesses. And serving in this new role will be Catherine Delgado, who will assume these new duties in addition to her role as my Deputy Chief of Staff. Now, Katie's parents emigrated from Peru to pursue the American dream in Peekskill, where she was born and grew up. A graduate of SUNY Cortland, finishing a master's in public education, administration rather, from Pace, she's fluent in Spanish, extremely active in the Hispanic community, and brings to the job a broad set of skills, insights, and experiences that will benefit our immigrant community. Katie, por favor, levántese. Katie is already working on a forum for entrepreneurs, especially those operating in Hispanic communities. It's going to be held on May 29th at the Gateway Center at Westchester Community College. The event, which is being run in partnership with the publication Latin Business Today, will provide entrepreneurs with information on how to raise capital, navigate contracts, and reach customers. And whether in English or Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Italian, Korean, Hebrew, or Arabic, Collaboration is how we deliver results. So what have we done? Well, first and foremost, we structurally reformed our finances by putting a halt to double-digit spending. Between 2005 and 2010, county spending went up 23%. Under our budgets for the last four years, spending went down 4%. Now that's not a slowdown. That's not a slowdown of an increase. That's a real, honest, hand-on-heart decrease and one of the largest decreases of any county budget in the state. How did we do it? The old-fashioned way. We pinched every penny and spent every dollar on the things that mattered most and delivered the most value. And like homeowners refinancing their mortgages, we reissued our bonds to take advantage of lower interest rates. That saved more than $1 million last year and more than $8 million since 2010. We also set a course for all government employees to pay a portion of their health care, just like everyone else, providing relief for taxpayers who had been picking up the entire $90 million bill by themselves. Now, the professionalism and dedication of our county workers is second to none, and I can't say that enough, but they are also expensive. As county executive, it is my job to figure out how to pay them and not bankrupt our taxpayers at the same time. And through frank and fair negotiations with our unions, we have been able to restructure contracts in ways that protect the interests of both workers and taxpayers. In just one example, our new contract with our correction officers brings down our future costs by $62,000 every time we make a new hire to replace a retiring officer. So when people talk about significant structural savings, this is one of them. In addition, after four years at the bargaining table, we now have contracts with seven of our eight unions, and they include employee health care contributions. So to the leadership and rank and file of Teamsters Local 456, the Correction Officers Benevolent Association, the Correction Superior Officers Association, the Police Benevolent Association, the Superior Officers Unit of the PBA, the District Attorney's PBA, and the New York State Nurses Association. Thank you all for your partnership. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> to the members of the CSEA, 
the one union we are still waiting for. I have to be honest and say that I am frustrated and disappointed. At the request of your union, an independent fact finder conducted a full hearing, heard all the arguments of both parties, weighed the evidence, and issued a report and recommendation for the settlement of a contract. Now, I didn't like everything proposed, but the fact finder did recognize the reality that in today's economy, every employee must pay a portion of their health care. I accepted the fact finder's recommendations because they struck a fair balance between the needs of the union and the needs of the taxpayers. Unfortunately, the leadership of the CSCA said no. So we will continue to negotiate, but the time has come for the leaders of the CSEA to give their members a contract and taxpayers some fairness. <laughs> Finding the right balance between services and costs is how we have been able to keep taxes in check and still meet the needs of our residents. And we like to think of it as smart government. Smart government is how we have managed to keep our social safety net strong. At a billion, half a billion dollars a year, the budget of our Department of Social Services is our largest in terms of dollars and people. And like every other place in the budget, our costs in social services have gone up. And like every other place, we have managed them by looking objectively at what was working and not working and then making the necessary fixes. And needless to say, the fixes, at least initially, are not always popular. Take daycare, for example. Here are the facts. Each year, the county spends more than $30 million on daycare subsidies, so no one can challenge our commitment. What we did was restructure the program. We shored up the finances with bipartisan support from the legislature, as we did it, and we did it in a way that gave them access to more families than ever before. Our changes expanded the budget to provide full daycare to almost 3,500 kids this year, and that's an increase of more than 300 since 2010 when we arrived. So making daycare accessible to more kids and more families is a good thing, a very good thing. In addition to running our programs smartly, the Department of Social Services has been vigilant in its efforts to root out fraud. Every dollar stolen or misspent as a result of fraud is a dollar that does not go to the needy. In 2013, Social Services overhauled its anti-fraud activities. The simple explanation is that it moved from a centralized approach to a decentralized one. Instead of operating its front-end detection system, known as FEDS, out of a single office, every office became part of the solution, and fraud detection began at the start of every application. The result? Paperwork backlogs of up to 45 days were reduced to two days, and savings increased to $20 million last year, a year-over-year -year improvement of 40%. Now those savings are how we keep the safety net strong and protect, protect taxpayers at the same time. So the broader point in all our efforts is that good management is our safety net's best protection. <laughs> Paratransit is an area where we have to put a good idea to work that not only has been saving money, but has also greatly improved our ability to serve those among us who are disabled. Last year, our paratransit vans made more than 220,000 trips around the county, taking 5,500 disabled residents to jobs, school, and other appointments that filled out their daily schedules. Paratransit vans are a lifeline for the disabled, but they are not perfect. They are expensive. And because they pick up multiple passengers and make multiple stops, getting from place to place can be time consuming. And there's also the stigma of not riding in an ordinary car or bus. So what if we could make our paratransit service more convenient and mainstream? What if, in addition to vans, we could make taxi service available to the disabled? Well, Evan Tainer, our director of the Office for the Disabled, had just that idea. We ran the numbers enlisted partners, and we got started. First in White Plains, followed by Peekskill and Nourishell. And today, our paratransit taxi service is making 200 trips a month in Nourishell, 
400 a month in White Plains, and 600 a month in Peekskill. And each ride saves money. The average taxi ride costs about $10, compared to $46 for a paratransit van. That difference has added up to savings of almost $500,000. And the program has also given welcome business to local taxi companies. But the benefits extend beyond money and commerce. The biggest benefit is making the lives of the disabled a little more ordinary. And to borrow a line from our great Westchester company, MasterCard, being able to get where you want, when you want, in a car that looks like everyone else's is priceless. And plans are underway to expand. The Parataxi program goes to our county's biggest city, Yonkers, in June. And special thanks to two of our taxi partners, Kevin Tuohy and Rich Miller from Act Now Limousine in Peekskill, who are here tonight with Evan Latainer, our Director of the Office for the Disabled. Let's, <clears throat> great job. Let's talk for a moment about the most important group of people in Westchester, our parents and our grandparents, on whose shoulders we stand today. Seniors make up roughly 20% of the population of Westchester. The number keeps getting bigger as medical science allows more of us to live longer lives. Seniors are vital. They're vital to our county because they are the living bridge that connects us to the past and positions us for the future. In Westchester, we are committed to keeping our seniors right here. And one way to do that is to keep taxes down. For seniors, property taxes are the biggest bill they pay each year. Another thing we do for seniors is to bring new ideas to old problems. For instance, we're currently developing a program that will monitor a senior's health, blood pressure, weight, and other vital signs. Other programs do that, but our new initiative called TIPS, or the Telehealth Intervention Program for Seniors, goes further. TIPS not only produces medical information, but its reports, or TIP sheets, also include economic and social assessments to make sure the individuals are receiving all the benefits they need, all at no cost to the senior. And this program will be formally announced on May 8th at our Salute to Seniors at the County Center. And one nice thing about the TIPS program is that it will largely be administered by volunteer college students. Another way we are keeping the generations connected is through our think tank. Now the idea was spearheaded by Catherine Kitty Wincoop of Pound Ridge. Kitty began by enlisting nine students from six local colleges and together they address transportation and isolation issues facing many of our seniors who live far removed from buses and trains in northern Westchester. In response to the findings of the think tank, the county has worked in a partnership with Family Services of Westchester to expand Ride Connect, which provides transportation for seniors to medical appointments, shopping, cultural events, and errands. Now, rides are provided solely by volunteers. In 2012, Ride Connect provided 1,000 referrals. Last year, that number jumped to more than 6,000. But we need more volunteers. So if you're looking for a good way to give back to seniors, this may be for you. To sign up and learn more, go to westchestergov.com. And I'd love to recognize Kitty Wincoop for her work on the think tank for helping to improve the quality of life for our seniors. Kitty. And sitting next to Kitty is Mae Carpenter, the Commissioner of Senior Programs and Services, who is the visionary for all our award-winning senior program. Great job, great job. In Westchester, we like to say we are New York's intellectual capital. In addition to being a catchy phrase, it has the benefit of being true. 45% of our county residents over the age of 25 have at least a bachelor's degree. It's a higher percentage than any of the other 50 states. Now this commitment to education, of course, starts at a young age. And we all know that Westchester has some of the best schools in the country. And one of the things that set our schools apart is their concentration on what has become known as STEM. 
Now, when I was in school, stems grew out of the ground and connected roots and leaves. But say STEM today, and conversation revolves around science, technology, engineering, and math. Now, whether you're old school or new, STEMs are all about growth. And our Youth Bureau has been working hard and hand-in-hand -hand with two of the county's leading corporations, Regeneron and Accorda Therapeutics, to encourage top-notch science education. Most recently, Regeneron announced the expansion of a new teacher training program called the STEM Teaching Fellowship. The program began when Lawrence Pareto, a teacher in Mamaroneck, teamed up with our Youth Bureau and Regeneron to start an after-school program in Mount Vernon designed to engage kids with science. Regeneron liked the program so much that it's now paying to train 10 additional teachers on how to integrate STEM into classroom instruction. NASA is even on board as a partner. So through our Youth Bureau, we will continue to focus on bringing quality science education to after-school programs around Westchester, with a particular emphasis on communities where school funding is under the most stress. We're also getting the word out about the great work our kids are doing thanks to a partnership between the county, Accorda, and WFAS Radio. Now each week on WFAS AM 1230, host Lisa Wexler talks to students who are winners of the Accorda Scientific Excellence Awards. Tune in every Sunday at 9 a.m. and you'll find out just how smart these kids are. And with us tonight is Peter Dworkin from Regeneron, David Lawrence from Accorda, Lisa Wexler from WFAS, and our Youth Bureau Director, Dr. Iris Pagan. And also joining us is Alan Cha, an Accord winner, and a senior at Walter Panis High School. And also a special tribute goes to Lawrence Pareto. Way to go, folks. Excellent. Larry and I actually went to high school together at Westlake. I'm amazed at you, Larry. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing we do in county government is more important than keeping our children and families safe. It was over a year ago, December 14th, 2012, when 20 children, eight boys and 12 girls, ages six and seven, and six adults were murdered at their school in neighboring Newtown, Connecticut. Like 9-11, that day shook us to our core changing forever our fundamental assumptions of what it means to be safe in America. As a county of almost one million people, we knew our response had to be comprehensive and lasting. And from this mindset, safer communities emerged. Here's what we've done so far. We brought educators, public safety officials, and first responders together for a school safety symposium. William Bratton, the police commissioner of New York City, schooled us on the critical importance of communication coordination, and collaboration in times of crisis. We gathered leaders from our communities to listen to Dr. Howard Spivak of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta tell us how to look beyond the symptoms of violence and address the causes. We created an action network of volunteers that looked at the connections between school absenteeism and youth crime and violence. We published a Safer Communities blueprint that, among other things, consolidates in one place dozens of available community resources. And we partnered with Westchester Jewish Community Services to be the first in New York to adopt youth mental health first aid on a countywide basis. The program is so important because the statistics are so staggering. Approximately 20% of kids ages 13 to 18 have had a seriously debilitating mental illness. That's one out of every five kids in our middle and high schools. Response to our Youth Mental Health First Aid initiative has been overwhelming. The first training session for 30 participants was at capacity within 24 hours. We now plan to add four or five additional sessions over the summer. Now, there is no way to guarantee that bad things won't happen to those we love. But if they do happen, we can say we did not sit back. One year and five months after Newtown, we set out to build a comprehensive and long-term approach to making our community safer, and we are doing just that.
Now, keeping communities safe is a team sport, and members of the Safer Communities team with us tonight are Alan Traeger, CEO of Westchester Jewish Community Services, Melissa Statz, our Acting Commissioner of Community Mental Health, and her deputy, Michael Orth. Thank you for all of your efforts. Stand up, Alan. In addition to keeping our communities safe, we need to keep them growing, and we have. Our population continues to increase, up a healthy 2% in the last three years, and that's because our economy continues to expand. Westchester's unemployment rate is one of the lowest in the state, and that didn't happen by accident. Now, I have said repeatedly that government does not create private sector jobs, but it does play a critical role in creating an environment that is either helpful or harmful for job creation. In Westchester, we have worked extremely hard to be on the side of the job creators. This year began with an outreach to all of our segments of the business community, young and old, big and small, profit and nonprofit. To my conference room, I invited small groups, which included executives from our largest corporations, entrepreneurs with companies at different stages of development, hospital officials, college presidents, municipal leaders, social service agency leaders, and young people just starting their careers and families. To all of them, the question would pose, what's working, what's not working, and how do we work together to get to the next level? All of the insights are being compiled in a report which will provide a compass to guide future economic growth. Now, the preliminary findings suggest a couple of target areas. The first is improving mass transit. The new Tappan Zee Bridge presents us with a once-in-a-generation opportunity to give our residents new transit options, especially along the 287 corridor. That's why I pushed so hard to make bus rapid transit, make sure it's incorporated into the plans for the new Tappan Zee Bridge from the start and not left as an afterthought to be forgotten. Now our plans call for improving our bus network, not only east-west from the Tappan Zee Bridge in Tarrytown to the Connecticut border in Portchester, but also north-south with White Plains acting as the central hub. The second target is to tighten the link between our colleges and businesses. Our kids need jobs when they graduate and our businesses need graduates with the right skills. The challenge, <laughs> that's right. The challenge is to make sure that our students have the right skills coming out of school. Now one emerging idea is to expand internship programs between Westchester businesses and colleges with the county center becoming the site of a giant matchmaking forum this fall. So you can think of it as a combination speed dating and internship mixer. Um, it's also no secret that some of our most iconic corporations have considered leaving Westchester. But we met with them, listened to their concerns, and partnered with them on strategies that could make them more successful and remain in Westchester at the same time. As a result, PepsiCo is not only staying in Westchester, but completely modernizing its world headquarters and purchase. MasterCard is also doing a similar upgrade to its headquarters in Harrison. Regeneron is expanding its campus in Mount Pleasant to one million square feet and adding 500 jobs. Accorda Therapeutics is expanding in Ardsley. We've also worked very closely with smaller companies. Access Point is a prime example. When the town of Ossining entered into an agreement three years ago to have the county provide police services, the town no longer needed the police station. Access Point, a technology services provider, was looking to expand. Our industrial development agency was able to broker a deal for Access Point to buy the old police station from the town for $1.4 million. Access Point is currently making renovations and expects to have 31 employees at work in the building next month and taxpayers in the town, county, and Ossining School District all benefit by having the property returned to the tax rolls. So that's an example of smart government. And Frank Skanga, President and CEO of Access Point, is here with us tonight. And Frank, thank you for investing in Westchester. And sitting with him is Eileen Mildenberger, the head of the Office of Economic Development, and Jim Coleman, the head of our IDA. To anyone with a business in Westchester or thinking of starting one here, Jim and Eileen are here to help you. Thank you very much.
and we hope one day you outgrow that old police station. Our successes also extend to keeping our not-for-profit sector vibrant. In 2008, the New York State Legislature, in its wisdom, decided to let a law lapse that allowed nonprofits access to low-cost tax-exempt financing. This made absolutely no sense. And so when Albany refused to fix its mistake, we took matters into our own hands here in Westchester. With the help of the Board of Legislators, Westchester County created its own local development corporation last year, which at no risk to taxpayers can give hospitals, schools, nursing homes, social service agencies, and other nonprofits access to lower cost tax exempt financing. There is no risk to taxpayers because the financing comes from private investors. And this money can be used to refinance existing debt or help fund new construction and renovation projects. And to date, the LDC has leveraged almost a half billion dollars. And beneficiaries include Pace University, SUNY Purchase, White Plains Hospital, Phelps Memorial Hospital, Northern Westchester Hospital, and Kendall on Hudson, the nursing and assisted living facility in Sleepy Hollow. The point is, that everyone benefits if not-for-profits can lower their costs. <laughs> as important as our partners are, there are things that the county can do, like put our own budget to work for the economy. Nowhere is that connection more clear than with the money allocated each year for capital projects. This year, our capital budget totals $271 million. The money goes to fix roads and bridges, enhance our technology and telecommunications, and upgrade our parks. The money also supports roughly 2,000 jobs a year. Better infrastructure and more jobs is certainly good news, but there is still room for improvement. One area is the time it takes to complete our capital projects. Anytime taxpayer dollars are involved, care must be taken to make sure that the money is spent the right way on the right things. But as the potholes from hell this winter showed, speed is also important. When the potholes are big enough to consume a Prius, immediate relief is needed. So with that in mind, tonight I am proposing that something be called the County Road and Bridge Urgent Restoration Program. This program This program will put $25 million aside over the next five years so that money is always available when our roads and bridges require urgent attention. Now the money won't just be for temporary fixes to potholes, it will allow us to make long-term improvements as well. The bonding will give us the flexibility to jumpstart new projects as road conditions dictate and not to be constrained by slow-moving budget schedules. The legislation will be delivered to the board in a few days and on behalf of all the tires and axles screaming for mercy, I ask that we act on this legislation as soon as possible. <laughs> it's important to note that we're working to make our economy greener as well as stronger. One way is through the Westchester Green Business Challenge, our public-private partnership with the Business Council of Westchester that is designed to help our businesses go green and at the same time save money and improve performance. More than 250 companies of all sizes have stepped up to the challenge. On the small end, we have the Blue Pig, an ice cream shop in Croton on Hudson, owned by Lisa Moyer. Now, though Lisa's ice cream comes in many flavors, green runs throughout. She starts by sourcing all her ingredients locally. She grows berries on her rooftop garden, and has employed green construction techniques throughout the store. And one more point, I took my family to the Blue Pig this past Saturday, and make no mistake, the ice cream is unbelievable. <laughs> and you kids are doing such a good job so far <laughs> that if you keep going this way for like 20 more minutes, we'll go to the Blue Pig again this weekend, all right? <laughs> On a bigger scale, there is New York Presbyterian Hospital. When you include its White Plains campus to its other holdings, New York Presbyterian is one of the largest hospital systems in the nation, employing 800 people in Westchester alone. 
Few companies do more to put environmental sustainability to work than New York Presbyterian. The hospital assigns green champions at each of its campuses to lead its environmental efforts, which have included establishing green procurement policies, purchasing hybrid vehicles, investing in energy and water efficient equipment, and recycling just about everything that's not nailed down. And at the county level, our environmental initiatives run the gamut as well, and even go as far as literally turning garbage into money and art. The material recovery facility in Yonkers, better known as the MRF, is where glass bottles, aluminum cans, plastic wraps, cardboard, and newspapers from across Westchester in the amount of 70,000 tons a year are brought to be sorted and recycled. Now the payoff for the county is that the MRF generates $6 million in revenue for county taxpayers and saves another $6 million from having to be disposed of as items as garbage. The MRF is also a classroom where 6,000 visitors, most of them students, learn about the benefits of recycling. In 2013, the Education Center at the MRF was renovated. And last week, treasure to tra trash to treasure, our recycled art gallery was added. Now the art is all made from recycled and reused material. Government can't get much smarter than when it's turning garbage into money, trash into art, and helping the environment at the same time. And with us tonight are members of our smart and green team, Lisa Moyer of the Blue Pig, Alyssa Kosowski and Steve Ferrando of New York uh, Presbyterian, Tom Loro, Westchester's Commissioner of Environmental Facilities, and Scott Fernquist, Manager of the Green Business Challenge on behalf of Westchester County. Great job. There are a lot of fun things to do in Westchester, and county government is a catalyst for many of them, like Bicycle Sundays on the Bronx River Parkway, now in its 40th year, our many cultural heritage festivals, and the 4th of July fireworks at the Kensico Dam. And speaking of the dam, if you're wondering why Kensico Plaza has been closed, it's because of a major project to plant new trees and install new lights. So when the park reopens later this spring, the lights will allow us to keep it open later at night. So to our many fans of the Kensico Dam Plaza, we will have you back in there in a couple weeks. Maybe winter will be over by then, but we'll have you in there. <laughs> now, one, one arrival that we are very excited about is that of the New York Knicks, whose developmental team will start playing its home games at the county center this fall. Talk about... <laughs> Talk about a great partnership. The NBA, Madison Square Garden, the New York Knicks, and county government have teamed up to bring professional basketball to fans in Westchester County and beyond at very affordable prices. Ticket prices will start at $10 for the 24 regular season games to be played between November and April. In other words, second mortgages won't be needed to take a family to a game. But the county wins by having a contract that covers its expenses plus sees revenues from ticket sales, parking, concessions, and advertising grow with the success of the team. With us tonight are Dave Howard, the president of MSG Sports, John Starks, the former Nick star, Nineteen ninety-three, John Duncan over, you know who, MJ. <laughs> and Bill Boyce, who heads the Westchester operations for the new team. And sitting with them is Kathy O'Connor, our Commissioner of Parks. Dave, John, Bill, and many others from MSG, the NBA of the Knicks. We will see you at the County Center on May 14th. May 14th is when they're going to initiate and actually shell, tell everybody what the new name for the team is, so we're all excited about that. Good basketball coming this fall, and congratulations to the Rangers last night. Speaking of fun, let's talk about Playland. The story of Playland is the story of what it's like to be a parent. You look at your kids, and you see enormous potential. Unfortunately, they don't just grow up by themselves. They need lots of love and attention, not to mention money. So where are we with Playland? 
Well, we are at the hard part. Hammering out details, crunching numbers, splitting differences, questioning assumptions, trusting partners, deflecting lawsuits, convincing doubters, <laughs> all in an effort to put our vision into contracts. Now, yesterday, we turned another corner as Sustainable Playland Incorporated recommitted to the project. Four years ago, when we started the reinvention of Playland, we knew that our road to success would be long and windy and full of many stops and starts. The last four weeks have actually been very constructive because they focused everyone's attention on the details that need to be worked out. And today we do have greater clarity. One thing SBI was concerned about was that its members, all volunteers, would be covered by the county in the event of lawsuits. We gave them that assurance. SBI also asked, and we agreed, to have the county play an even more active role in working out the details of the contracts with the professional operators being brought in to run the park. The good news is that SPI has assembled a top flight set of companies to run the activities within the park. Central Amusements International, an amusement park planner, developer, and operator, which operates Luna Park at Coney Island. American Skating Entertainment Centers, the largest independent owner-operator of ice rink facilities in the U.S., which includes, by the way, the Westchester Skating Academy in Elmsford. Playland Sports, a new company started by Rye residents who have teamed up with Pinnacle Indoor Sports, a national indoor sports complex developer who designed House of Sports in Ardsley. The hard part is that we have to fin finalize contracts, but that's where our full attention is now focused. The next immediate step is to resume the hearings before the Board of Legislators. And I want to thank Chairman Kaplowitz for his patience. He has my commitment that my administration will work with him to provide the information needed for the Board of Legislators to complete its due diligence on the Playland Improvement Plan before it. Thank you again. <laughs> Let me summarize the path forward with Playland with this story. A couple of years ago in the fall, Sheila and I took the kids for a stroll on the boardwalk. And to be honest, the kids were not too thrilled because the amusement area was closed for the season and they wanted to go on the rides. So I explained that it was closed and Kylie said to me, but dad, you can, it open, you can open it up, you have the keys. <laughs> Wally world. <laughs> this year, the park opens May 10th and as long as I have the keys, I will work as hard as I can to make the park financially viable so we can keep it open for generations to come. The affordable housing settlement with the federal government has been another challenge. Since I inherited the settlement on my first day in office, I have approached it from the rule of law. The county would meet its obligations in full, but would not be bullied by the federal government, in its words, to go beyond the four corners of the settlement. And although it falls, And although it falls on deaf ears at HUD every time we mention it, these two facts are irrefutable. Westchester is ahead of schedule in meeting its obligations to have 750 units of affordable housing built in the settlement's 31 communities. And that progress would not be possible if local zoning in those communities did not allow it. The latest tally shows all 31 communities have identified potential projects. 403 units have financing in place. 385 have building permits already surpassing this year's obligation. Now frankly, this progress is phenomenal. Any suburban housing development, let alone a government project, that's ahead of schedule is something that rarely happens in real life. But it has happened in Westchester. And it happened because of the professionalism of our planning department and the cooperation we have received from our municipalities. And my continuing thanks to all those who have worked so hard. Thank you very much for moving this forward. <laughs> HUD has been another story. Now, while we never expected a parade, 
we have been surprised and disappointed at HUD's decision to punish the very people it claims to help in its attempt to dismantle our local zoning. This year, HUD is threatening to renege, and we strongly believe without any legal justification on a previous promise of $5 million in community development block grants. The money is for revitalizing neighborhoods, preventing homelessness, and how's this for irony, helping to build affordable housing. The immediate problem is that our communities are without the money while the case goes through the courts. And it needs to be emphasized that most of the communities stiffed by HUD have nothing to do with the settlement. That's just not right or fair. So what do we do about it? Some say we should do whatever it takes to get the funds restored. And yes, a lot of money is at stake. But everyone needs to understand exactly what HUD is demanding in return for the money. From HUD's point of view, the settlement was never about building affordable housing. The agency's behavior over the last four years proves that. For HUD, the goal is control of our local communities. Dismantle zoning regulations and there are no longer any checks or balances on the agency's social engineering ambitions in Westchester now as well in Long Island or anywhere around the country. The community development block grants have been HUD's prime weapon. The strategy was simple. Withhold the money and wait for the county to capitulate on zoning. But that didn't happen and won't happen while I'm county executive. Westchester is not for sale, not for five dollars, five million, or five billion. We have fought a principled fight because we believe the future of our communities belongs first and foremost to our residents and not to unelected bureaucrats in Washington. This is not an act of defiance. It is an affirmation of the principles on which our nation was built. The Founding Fathers wisely understood that the government closest to the people is usually the best government. Not because local officials have a wisdom on, on you know, monopoly on wisdom. They don't. But neither does the federal government. What local officials do have is an intimate, every day of the year understanding of how life is actually lived on the streets and in the neighborhoods of our communities. It is why home rule is protected by the New York State Constitution. So how do we move forward? Well, tonight I am proposing that Westchester County start its own block grant program for the communities being held hostage by HUD. The program will replace the HUD funding with county money financed through a bond issue. All the same rules will apply and the county will handle the administrative processes, which it already does. But instead of being held up by the whims of Washington, Westchester can move forward independently and do the right thing for our own communities. So this act of independence... This act of independence to opt out of the HUD program solves a number of problems. It will get money to our communities. It will get the money there quickly by taking the process away from Washington bureaucrats. It will be affordable for our taxpayers. Financing a $5 million program will cost each household in Westchester about a dollar a year. And most important, <laughs> and most important, this initiative will remove the stranglehold that HUD has been using in its attempt to dismantle our local zoning. Never has one dollar been able to buy so much. 
We have talked about what we have done, what we are doing, and what we plan to do. Let's talk about how we have to pay for things. The payoff for taxpayers is what we have remained true to our word. We promised tax relief and we delivered it. Following a 17% rise in the tax levy between 2005 and 2010, we cut the tax levy 2% in 2011. And, and in 2012, 2013, and 2014, we held the tax levy flat, flat, and flat again. That's a minus two followed by three zeros. Not bad. Now the critics, the critics will say that county taxes make up only about 20% of your local property tax bill, and that's, that's correct. The biggest portion of the bill, typically about 60%, pays for schools, and the remaining 20% goes to your local town or village and special districts. So it's certainly true that a 2% decrease on 20% of your property tax bill is not going to be life-changing, but it does show that at least county government has put a stop to tax and spend madness. And at the county level, our goal has been to strike the right balance between what's nice to have and what's really needed. Curb indulgence, stop waste, and reward value. Our idea has been to run a government that can live within its means, and here's why. If our seniors must live within their means as they struggle to pay property taxes on their homes whose mortgages were paid off long ago, if our young families must live within their means as they scrimp to put every spare dollar into the college fund, if our recent graduates must live within their means as they start careers with big college loans to pay off, then their county government count and must do it too. So tonight, I repeat my pledge and I renew it as I have made to the people of Westchester for the last four years that I will submit a budget for 2015 with no increase in the county property tax levy. Our fight to bring government spending and taxes under control doesn't stop in Westchester. The next battle is in Albany because that's where our money is consumed. This year, 85% of the Westchester County tax levy will go directly to Albany to pay for just nine state unfunded mandates. Now, Albany politicians will say, what about all the state aid we send to Westchester? Fact. These nine unfunded mandates cost Westchester $450 million. Fact, Westchester receives about $250 million in state aid. In other words, Albany sends us a dollar, charges us two, and by the time the year is over, we owe them more than $200 million. In fact, if this wasn't government, it would be illegal. <laughs> Instead of just Albany math, that's what it is. We've become Albany's ATM. And the tax cap only makes things worse. The 2% tax cap forces counties, local municipalities, and school districts to be fiscally responsible. And that's a good thing. But instead of capping its own spending, Albany just keeps sending us bigger and bigger bills. Less money for local needs like parks and libraries, schools, roads, hospitals. More money for the Albany spending machine. Without relief from unfunded mandates, local communities will continue to suffer. Our top legislative priority must be to unite our cities, towns, villages, and school districts to hold Albany accountable. Real mandate relief is needed. The crisis is here, and the time to act is right now. So what to do about Albany? Did somebody say elephant in the room? <laughs> on November 5th of last year, <laughs> on November 5th of last year, the voters of Westchester returned me to this job, which I love. Election night was one of those moments when it seems a million things are happening all at once. The first was anxiety. Elections at the county level are always uphill climbs for Republicans in Westchester. And I honestly had no idea of whether I would be reelected. Sending resumes out on Wednesday was a real possibility. Then the returns came in and the results were really good. And people in Westchester validated their support
for the decisions we had made, and I thank you for that. But the media was already on to the next horse race and declared me a possible gubernatorial candidate. President Clinton said he never inhaled. I never got a chance to exhale. <laughs> I mean, it was flattering to be considered for the job of governor. It was also very daunting. And after some soul searching and discussions with my wife and leaders from around the state, it boiled down to this. Could my running for governor make a positive difference for both Westchester and New York? And ultimately, my answer was yes. The issues of Westchester... <laughs> the issues of Westchester and New York State are really one and the same. Jobs, taxes, education, the environment, preserving the social safety net and bringing some sanity to the burden of unfunded mandates all desperately need attention right now. Albany is like a giant vacuum sucking money, jobs, and energy from local communities, and it's time to pull the plug. And we pulled the plug on runaway taxes and spending in Westchester, and what happened? Government got more accountable, services got delivered, and jobs got created. There is no reason the same can't be done in Albany. New York is losing. We are dead last 50th in this state in all the wrong categories. Highest taxes in the nation, worst business climate, worst economic outlook, most corruption, highest per pupil spending and bottom half in results, highest electricity rates, and more people fleeing our state than any other state in the country. You know, when traveling this beautiful state of ours, my mind sometimes drifts back home where I could be watching Sean play lacrosse, or Kylie's cheerleading, or reading a bedtime story to Ashlyn. But it's for them and all the people of this beautiful state that I threw my hat in the ring. Now I'm hoping to bring to Albany what has worked successfully in Westchester. And nothing will help Westchester more than a state government that is accountable and lives within its means. And will I be successful? I don't know. But I do know this. The time to try is now and both Westchester and the state will benefit from an honest debate about how to really fix what's broken. And that's why I'm running, to continue to be part of the solution. So I begin my second term thankful to be here. Westchester is a place we all love. Every day the job is to make Westchester an even better place. And to the challenge, I bring my head to find new answers, my heart to never forget the needs of all of our residents, and my spine to do what is right, even if it's not popular. Westchester begins with we, and we have the people, resources, and will to overcome every obstacle in front of us. And together is how we will continue to move forward, and move forward we will. Thank you so much, and God bless all of you.